and the Romans are not done for us. Hello and welcome to the Ancient History Hound podcast. My name's Neil and you can find me on Twitter at Ancient Blogger and more ancient history content on my website ancientblogger.com. This episode is all about Tullus Hostilius, Rome's third king. It's a continuation of my Roman Kings miniseries. And just in case you weren't aware, I've already covered Romulus in my Foundation of Rome episode and the second Roman king in my Numa Pompilius episode. If you haven't listened to these, and to be fair, even if you have, I think it's worth a brief catch up as to where we are. Our first king was Romulus, whose rule can be described as certainly eventful and abides by the maximum of living by the sword and dying by it. Rome's second king was Numa Pompilius, who was a Sabine with a reputation for piety and religious observance. Rome was badly lacking in both of these, and Numa set about establishing a religious infrastructure which included the Vestal Virgins. Things weren't all peachy though. There's a counter view that Numa was a bit of a salesman and that his work was really aimed at keeping the Roman mob busy and dutifully fearful of the gods. And this was done by stories about him talking to the gods, working wonders and even a rite where he was able to draw down thunder and lightning. Make a note of that by the way. Before I go further, I should mention our sources. The full fat version of what I'm going to say can be heard in the Foundation of Rome episode where I discuss the challenge of trying to understand Rome's early days. The crux of this is that most of our source material dates from the 1st century BCE onwards. Though it may have borrowed from earlier sources, we don't have anything contemporary. The sources in question are Livy and Dionysus of Halicarnassus, who are referred to as just Dionysus. What they provide is a picture of Rome at this time, and one which, in some instances, we have to suspend our disbelief for. The approach I take is to engage with it as much as I can, and as is plausible, but that's not to say I agree with everything, and in fairness, neither do the sources in some instances. Sometimes, the obviously fabricated event is hiding something else. The challenge is what that might be. And also, what does it say about Rome? That this was considered true, that this was considered something they wanted to be believed about Rome. Allow me to start then. The year is 673 BCE, and Rome finds itself without a king. The last time this had happened was some 40 years ago, after Romulus had died, and was succeeded, as I've mentioned, by Numa Pompilius. Upon the death of Numa, Rome reverted to a type of government known as an interregnum, and this was a temporary solution, wherein senators took turns in charge, and this prevented any one figure seizing power. All this was done whilst a candidate for the top job was considered. In Rome, kings weren't born to rule, they were chosen. The process for the choice isn't provided in any great detail. There seems to have been a two-tiered event. The Senate identified their man, and then the people ratified him. The choice this time was Tullus Hostilius. Tullus doesn't seem to have been a particularly big player in Rome up until this point. His grandfather had fought against the Sabines in Rome under Romulus, but... That's about it. Ironically, this may have made him a good candidate. The Senate wasn't a homogenous group. Even under Romulus, he'd start to develop factions. It's plausible then that a candidate who is neutral to everyone and would be a very good solution, as every faction would agree to them as not being a threat. The next step was for the people to confirm Tullus as their king, which they obviously did, and Tullus' first act was a bit of a thank you to them. The context was land reform, something which would become a hot potato in Roman politics much later on. Even though Rome was still in its infancy, not yet 100 years old, there was a class in Rome, if you can call that, who existed in abject poverty. Having no land of their own, this group worked the land of others. Tullus, as a king, had a fair amount of spare land going about, which had been passed down to him through Numa. This he divided up and allocated to those without any land. It was a classic political giveaway, and like anything given free, there must have been a reason for it. And I've got two possibilities. The first is that this group were becoming increasingly disgruntled with their lot, as you might imagine. Rome, after all, had been sold as somewhere where immigrants, ex-slaves and practically anyone could go and make something of themselves, within reason of course. The very existence of this group chides somewhat against this notion, and the danger was that they would revolt or cause some form of instability. 
Her second idea, and one not mutually exclusive, I should add, was that Tullus had made some form of promise to the people if they voted to secure him king. This suggests the people took much interest in ratifying the candidate the Senate had given, but let's indulge ourselves with the idea that this was some sort of election promise. Perhaps Tullus was a bit fearful about his candidacy, and to secure the thumbs up from the people, he put it about that he didn't mind losing a bit of his land to others around him. What I can be certain of is that keeping the poor on the side had its benefits, because Tullus needed an army. Under the previous king, Numa, Rome's policy to its neighbours was couched far more in the cultural than the martial, hence Numa's religious reforms and institutions. But now things were different. Rome had a rested generation of men it could pull into action, and Tullus took little time to do so. The subject of Rome's military attention might surprise you. It wasn't one of the tribes which Rome was surrounded by, or a more distant rival. It was its own parent city, Alba. In case you haven't listened to my Foundation of Rome episode, and apologies, it keeps feeling like I'm plugging it, but in there I mention and I talk about exactly how Rome was founded. Originally there was Lavinium, which founded Alba, and from this Romulus and Remus founded Rome. Colonies were two a penny, or denarii in antiquity. Greek city-states established many in southern Italy to the extent that it was later known as Magna Graecia, which translates as Great Greece. But it wasn't just them. The Phoenicians from the eastern Mediterranean had been setting up colonies all over the place, and one such colony, Carthage, later became very well known to Rome, as you may well know. The relationship between the parent city and colony was expected to be cordial at least, but that wasn't always the case. Dionysus places the blame for the outbreak of war with Alba and wrote that it was the Alban king who looked to draw Rome into conflict by initiating a number of cattle raids. Livy admits this detail but does add that from the outset Tullus was more combative than Romulus which is really quite saying something. So it's entirely reasonable to think that if it hadn't been Alba it would have been someone else. Before any action took place a more subtle diplomatic game was had. Both sides wanted to be seen as the victim of the other's aggression. Each wanted to claim that they had sought satisfaction from the other, and when this wasn't forthcoming, it was the other lot who'd broken the oath and treaty between parent city and colony. If you're wondering why, well, breaking an oath was a serious thing to do. The aggrieved side, in theory, could take the moral and thus religious high ground. The race was on to be the first to get rejected, Tullus sent an embassy to Alba with the instructions to get to Alba the Alban king as soon as possible and get turned down. Meanwhile, Tullus hosted the Alban embassy in fine fashion, all the while delaying the formal talks. He was so successful that the Roman embassy had appealed to Alba, been rejected and returned with the news before the Albans even got their hearing. Rome then was set to go to war with Alba. Dionysus recalls that the location the two sides met was 40 stades from Rome. As of one stage is 185 metres, or 606.9 feet, this means that the battlefield was 7.4 kilometres, or 4.5 miles from Rome. As Alba was south-east of Rome, I doffed the distalker and using an online map, plotted a point that that distance and that direction from the Roman Forum. It ended up in the Capanelli district of Rome. When the Alban king called Cluilius arrived, he dug fortifications which became a landmark in antiquity known as Cluilius's Trench, though sadly they haven't survived today. Obviously, as if they had, we'd know exactly where the battlefield was. King Cluilius never got out of his trench, as neither army was prepared to fight the other, and one night the king died. Tullus jumped on this as proof that the gods had exacted justice on Cluilius for breaking the truce. Following the king's death, a new figure merged onto the scene, who had been chosen by the generals in the Alban camp. His name was Metius Fufetius. Metius has the distinction of being my second favourite name from early Rome, just trailing behind Titus Tatius. I don't know why, but when I read it, I picture either a cat belonging to an eccentric or an 18th century dandy from London. The truth was that Metius was a keen political operator who realised immediately there was a far greater danger both to Alba and Rome than their respective armies. You see, as Rome had expanded, it had defeated other cities in the area and made them subjects. Two of these, Vei and Fidnae, were eager for Rome and Alba to clash as it would give them an opportunity to strike back at a weakened Rome and if Rome fell, then Alba would be next. Metius relayed this message to Tullus and suggested that they needed to talk about it. Tullus had heard similar rumours, and the two kings met and chewed over the options. 
Dionysus wrote of an entire dialogue between Tullus and Metius, where the two debated over which should rule the other. Presumably this was invented by Dionysus, but what's interesting is that what he imagined their respective positions to have been. For Alba, the case was that they should rule because they were the parent city. Metius also descends into a kind of awkward dialogue, where he states that Rome had allowed too many immigrants and barbarians as citizens, whereas Alba was and continued to be pure, and they were Greek. Worse still, in Rome, lower classes now rule or have some sort of political power. We cannot know how this played out to his audience, but bear in mind how Rome of the 1st century BCE would have been exactly this sort of a place, that is to say, full of immigrants and lower class citizens who had a political identity. My thoughts are that this was a technique of casting Alba in a very unfavourable light. Tullus' response was to turn this criticism on its head. The practice of having the lower classes access the political process was something which was inspired by a Greek city, so they were Greek and that city was Athens. This point is both a neat one, but also a huge anachronistic flag. For those of you who didn't know, democracy came into effect at the end of the 6th century BCE in Athens, and the speech Tullus gives is 70 or so years before this happened. But there's still some worth here. If Dionysus wanted it to be a credible debate, he'd need to include what would have been tangible and rational arguments, so perhaps we can use this dialogue as a wider way of understanding viable tensions between parent city and colony. I'll skip forward now because what happened next was one of the legendary stories of Rome. A decision needed to be reached on whether Rome or Alba should take charge of the other. A full battle wasn't something either side wanted, so instead it would be decided by a duel. In this case, it wasn't a duel between two single individuals. Instead, three brothers from Rome would fight three brothers from Alba. Rome was represented by the Herati and Alba by the Curiati. They'd fight with the armies watching, presumably on the site selected for the battle, which never really happened. Livy and Dionysus both differ slightly in terms of the order of the events of what happened next, but the outcome was roughly the same. After an initial round of fighting, the Curiati were left with a numerical advantage. Two or three brothers stood, albeit carrying significant injuries, and a sole Harati faced off against them. In both accounts, the tactic of the Harati was to split his opponents up, and he did so by running off. As the Curiati were carrying injuries, they were strung out, and the Harati brother then ran back and engaged them individually. The first Curiati provided the only real opposition, though even then he doesn't seem to have been anywhere near in a good condition to fight. This then left the remaining brother, or brothers, as easy pickings. With the Curiati slain, the Romans had won, and the Romans obviously celebrated, but it's not exactly the heroic battle you might have expected. There's no moment of Aristea from a Homeric hero type scenario on the battlefield. In fact, I immediately think of the scene in the life of Brian, where a chap in the arena runs around until the gladiator chasing him has a heart attack. Before I get to the outcome and what happened after this, a further incident makes this even more awkward. Upon him returning to Rome, the Harati brother noticed his sister mourning for one of the Curiati, who she'd actually been in love with. Yeah, it's that sort of awkward moment. But the Harati brother decided to somewhat escalate it by killing his sister on the spot. This caused no small outrage and Tullus was placed in a very difficult situation. It was partially solved by the father of the Rati, who pleaded in court that his son had done the right thing and that it was his role, not the Roman states, to punish him if he thought he'd done anything wrong. Eventually, a compromise was worked out where the Harati paid a fine and underwent religious purification. As you might expect, in the Alban camp, things weren't particularly great. The people, presumably the same who thought it was a good idea to have the duel, now thought it a stupid way of resolving a quarrel, proof positive that any type of fan can be fickle. Metius, therefore, had a real challenge, and his solution to all of this was to quote Blackadder, a cunning plan. It might seem a bit sarcastic, but I mean that it was quite a cunning plan. Metius used the current information he had available, that is to say, Rome had rivals around which were happy to revolt if given an opportunity. Fidne had already shown that it was happy to do, undertake such a type of rebellion. So, Metius contacted them. Fidne, a city around 8 kilometres north of Rome, would openly rebel, 
The Romans would obviously move against them, and Alba would join and fight alongside them. And at the right moment, Metius would betray the Romans and attack them. I realise at this point I've not said much about the troops which were used at this time, and this has been deliberate, as there's a later king who is associated with a wide reform of the army, and I'm going to talk about that at that point with that king. But it's only fair to give you some description of the troop types. To start with, the theme would be basic, and far more in line with the Greek hoplite, where a soldier fought with a spear as a primal weapon and carried a shield. The richer you were, the better your equipment you might have, extending to some form of head protection and even basic armour, which would most likely take the form of a chest plate. Those that could afford horses would form a basic cavalry arm. But in short, nothing like the late, later Roman legionaries with their short swords and heavier armour. And I just wanted to move to get that picture out of your head in case that's what you were thinking or visualising with these battles. The troops were also amateurs, and that's not to say they weren't capable but these weren't professionally drilled soldiers. They were farmers and merchants. Fortunately, much of the time, they're up against other citizen armies, so we can imagine the battle experience as being perhaps a bit clumsy at best. Tullus took the initiative and marched to Fidnae when he heard of the rebellion, and he took with him Metius and the Albans. As Tullus engaged with the Fidnaean army, Metius withdrew to a hill on the Roman flank. Tullus was no fool and soon realised what was going on, but he didn't panic. He shouted to his men that the departing Alban army were in fact making a clever flanking movement on the enemy. The Fidne army actually heard this and believed him, which isn't that surprising. Now, if Metius' betrayal was a secret plan, the common soldiers fighting for the Fidne army weren't likely to be in the know about it. The troops from Fidne then started to panic and fled. Metius realised that there was no chance of his betrayal working, so he joined in the pursuit. After the victory, Tullus kept up the act that he had no idea that Metius had tried to betray him. And the following day, the armies assembled for a parade. At this point, Tullus revealed what he knew and confronted Metius. He laid no blame at the common Alban soldier, which was probably more practical than anything else. No, the blame lay firmly at Metius' feet. The same feet which would soon be at a fair distance from the rest of him because the punishment he received was really quite something, even by Roman standards. Livy even commented that this was the only time Rome had punished anyone in such a barbaric way. And given what the Romans tended to be like, that's really saying a lot. The fate for Metius was to be strung between four teams of chariots and their respective horses. Each chariot team was attached to a limb. You've probably worked out where this is going. Upon being driven in their respective directions, Metius was torn into bits. Troops were then sent to Alba to help move the population to Rome, and the city itself was levelled, save one temple. Of course, this impacted Rome. It was a large migration of people, and Livy included in his list of Alban nobles the Julii, who you might know as the family which Julius Caesar was descended from. I think we can safely say this was retrospectively playing to his audience, it might not have won him much acclaim with the Caesars, but leaving his family out might have raised eyebrows. I should also mention that other families were mentioned, so perhaps there's also a case of Livy hedging his bets by assuring those noble families of Rome were kept happy by having their lineages duly etched in history. To accommodate this increase in population, Rome expanded the housing on the Caelian Hill. Of equal significance was Tullus' involvement in building the first dedicated Senate house in Rome, the Curia Hostilius. Prior to this, a temple had been used as a sort of makeshift meeting place, but Tullus is strongly linked to the initial Senate house, and I say that because it's not the one you might see today. That's the Curia Julia, built by Julius Caesar. Tullius' building was absorbed within the later Senate house developments, and today the Santi Lucia e Martina church stands where it used to be. The military adventures which Tullus had didn't end with the victories against Alba and Fidene. Rome was expanding and using its military muscle to extend its influence and territories. The Sabines, the people from which the previous king Numa had come from, were the next to come into scope. Much like Alba, this was triggered by a diplomatic incident, which couldn't be solved, and near the city of Eretum the two sides met, already having fought a previous battle which had been inconclusive. The outcome, as you've probably guessed, was a victory for Rome, and down in part either to a pledge Tullus had made with the heavens, and which involved more public festivals, 
and the Sally, those dancing priests I mentioned in the episode of Numa, or the Roman cavalry, which affected a heavy charge against the Sabines. Which is it? Well, it's your call. Yet, for all his success, the incident with Alba seemed to have caught up with Tullus. Livy is not afraid to report on unusual goings-on, and according to him, stones were reported to have fallen on Mount Alba, where the city once stood. Upon investigation, those sent found stones falling in abundance and heaped around the place. And if that wasn't disturbing, a voice was heard coming from the summit which scorned the Albans for abandoning their religious practices. A possible reading of the events here is that Rome and Alba had differed in how and what they worshipped. And this is curious, as you might expect Rome to have copycatted Alba in this respect. But remember how Livy and Dionysus had painted Numa, the second king, as being someone who finally gave Rome some religious oomph. Logic would dictate, then, that Rome under Romulus wasn't all that religious, and that Numa had installed a lot of things that perhaps were not been at Alba. We can take this a step further, and conclude that the Sabine influence of Numa, he was Sabine after all, had meant Rome was worshipping and showing religious fidelity in a way which was possibly different to Alba, and perhaps even in contrast to it. It wasn't religion which was just causing problems. Livy goes further and writes of a plague which hit Rome just after the strange voice on Mount Alba. The implication isn't particularly subtle. Religious impropriety equals punishment by disease. It's often a common association. Eventually, Tullus succumbed to the illness, which didn't kill him, but made him forget his previously pious ways. And to quote Livy, he suddenly fell under the spell of all sorts of superstitions, both large and small, to the point that the people started to follow his lead. Plutarch expands on this and contrasts the pious Numa with the Tullus, who was given over to a type of superstition which sat in stark contrast to the religion Numa had embedded at Rome. Exactly what this superstition was isn't clear, sadly. We'll probably never know whether this just was you know, some form of eccentricities picked up towards the end of his reign, or a more significant religious schism forming. It could have been that a substantial problem occurred toward the latter part of Tullus' reign. Perhaps the influx of the Albans caused some tension with the established Roman religious mores. Had this been the end of the association Tullus had with straying from the conventional religious norm, we might shrug it off. But it wasn't, and the death of Tullus has this theme running through it. Both Livy and Dionysus report that Tullus was killed by lightning, either outright, being struck by lightning, or that it set his home on fire and he died in the blaze, along with his family. And both link it to a divine punishment. Dionysus wrote that the reasons the heavens punished Tullus was linked to an omission of public rights and the introduction of others which were foreign to the Romans. Livy was even more specific. It was the rites to Jupiter Elysius that had been performed incorrectly, which had angered Jupiter, who shortly after sent a thunderbolt aimed towards Tullus and his house. For those who have listened to the episode on Numa, you might remember Jupiter Elysius. It was a rite performed when Numa caused thunder and lightning to occur. This was duly interpreted and read. However, Numa had a charm which prevented him from being struck by lightning, and Tullus evidently didn't. Tullus' death was linked to two types of irreligious behaviour. For Livy, it was personal. After all, Tullus had not performed a significant religious rite properly. For Dionysus, it was a wider issue. Rome, under Tullus, was a place where the traditional rites weren't being attended to, and worse still, the foreign ones were being brought in. Dionysus does offer one alternative to the death by lightning, which both he and Livy put on the coroner's report for Tullus. In a tale of treachery so devious it could only relate to Roman politics at pretty much any period, Tullus' successor had him killed and then burned the house down, and he then pointed at the sky and blamed Jupiter. And if this sounds a little far-fetched, if you think that no one in Rome would fall for such a tale, let me remind you of how Romulus, and I'm doing the air quotes with my fingers here, died. He either ascended to heaven in a storm and later appeared to a sole senator with instructions to tell the populace that he'd been taken to the heavens and was doing very nicely, thank you for asking, or he was killed by a group of senators who then hid his body and covered up the death and had one of their number recount meeting his ghostly form. I'll leave that one with you. The end of Tullus was couched within either a form of political assassination or outright irreligious behaviour. Both seem in stark contrast to how he was later celebrated. In Virgil's poem The Aeneid, Aeneas visits the land of the dead, 
and is shown the later kings of Rome. Tullus is described as disrupting his country's peace to rouse a stagnant people, armies stale to the taste of triumph, back to war again. Cicero lords him in his work on the Republic. He praises how Tullus didn't extend his powers outside his remit, built the Senate House, and by doing so, Cicero isn't just thanking him for the nice building. He's commenting on how Tullus respected the political institution, and of course, he's also praised for his military skill. What I found interesting, and perhaps even surprising, was that Tullus reigned for approximately 30 years. So his activities extend way past the notable battles I've mentioned, and this means there was a lot of empty space, a lot of years where we just don't know what happened. Though obviously Tullus did spend a fair amount of time campaigning, but he would have spent many years not campaigning, and these years and what happened in them are somewhat lost to us. He's reduced to a series of battles and a legendary story and a weird death. And I suppose in many ways that's what we have in a lot of our histories. We don't have anything that really gives a lot of detail throughout someone's entire career. But at the same time, it's notable that he wasn't a short-lived king. He reigned for a reasonable amount of time. A counterpoint to all of this might be to look at what Tullus gave Rome as a template going into the future. Namely, subjugate those around you and increase your military influence. Make sure the distance between the walls of Rome and your boundaries increases year on year, and you do this through political arrangements and sheer force. It might be then easier to think of Tullus in this way, as someone who set the agenda for Rome going onwards. And perhaps that's a nice way to remember him, and not the grisly way he died, and the grisly way he killed other people. And it's also where I'm going to leave it now. I hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast, and as ever, I'm going to ask you to leave a review if you can on whichever platform you use to listen to your podcast. And I also want to say a thank you to you. Yes, you. Podcasters are often all about getting more and more listeners, and in fairness, that's always good. We're told, more listeners, better podcast. But sometimes we can easily forget the audience we've already got. So if you're a newcomer, hello. And if you're a returning listener, hi, and thanks for the support. And if you want to get back to me about anything, including this podcast, I'm on Twitter at AncientBlogger. Till the next time, stay safe and keep well.